but I appreciate your thought. All right. So if we're going to talk about corporations, organizations, stock transactions, dividends, and those type of things in chapter 11 here. So I'm going to kind of walk through the PowerPoints and we'll start working through some of the problems in the chapter. So the first thing we'll talk about is our learning objectives here. We will be describing the nature of the corporate forming, uh, forming of corporation and that type of stuff. And then we'll describe two main sources of stockholders equity, what they are. And what we're going to do is describe and illustrate the characteristics of the different classes of stock and how they're issued and those type of things. We'll talk about those. And then we'll get to this, describe and illustrate the accounting for cash dividends and stock dividends, what they are, what's the difference, and all that good stuff. And we'll describe and illustrate the accounting for treasury stock transactions, and what that really means. Uh, describe and illustrate the reporting of uh, stockholders' equity and talk about stock splits. And then finally, take a look at earnings per share, which you've probably heard about many, many times. So we'll talk a little bit about what those things are. All right, so chapter 11. So let's talk about the cor corporations. I'll give you a moment to read this. As you're reading that, I want you to be real clear on what that really means there. It's a separate legal entity. So if somebody passes away that owns it, it's this corporation is still there, it doesn't die with that person. So remember, it's a separate legal entity. Secondly, typically, you're, if you were sued, they can't go after your personal assets. Let's say I own Google, a portion of Google, if they were sued for some stuff, and I, they're a corporation and they're set up that way, I may have, I should have limited liability on most of the things that are Yeah, if you make bad, it costs trouble. But on a, on a, most of, as long as you don't step way out, out of bounds on those type of things, but if you have some debts as a part of that, they're not even going after So typically what happens is the corporation sells shares of ownership called stock, and that's what we're going to talk about in this chapter. So stockholders are shareholders who own the corporation, they can buy and sell stock without the corporation's operations or uh, messing with their existence there. So they can share, transact, let's just take Google, which is on the front of our chapter 11 here. You, they can transact and, make, and trade shares, and people own them. I've, I had some, sold some, bought some back, you know, I can trade, come in and out with that. It doesn't affect what they're doing, it just affects the shares that are out there. That's all it does. Now, it does change their stock price, that goes up and down, but it doesn't affect their operations. All right, so the corporations whose shares of stock are traded in publicly, in public markets are called public corporations. That's important. The public corporations part is very important, because we're going to talk about regulations. Before we talk a little bit about Sarbanes-Oxley, what all that means, that's where the public corporations come in. Now, there's also corporations that are not traded publicly, and they may be owned by a small group, it may be, and they also have limited liability there. Again, is, is that there, but the non-public or private usually are smaller companies or they're just owned by a small group of individuals. And so I worked for a company that was an S-Corp, small company, but we had, still had about 10 million sales that we had. And so I was, and then I've also worked for a huge Fortune 500 company. So there's a little difference in some of those things there. Uh, one of the big differences is the Sarbanes-Oxley and the controls that are make sure they're placed on a public trading company. But you also have those. The stockholders control a corporation by electing its board directors. This board meets periodically to establish the policies and that stuff. And they will elect or select a uh, chief executive officer. So they're the ones that are going to find a CEO to run the company for the everyday operations. And it, many of the major other officers that are part of the company, like the CFO and those type of things. All right. So this is how it breaks down here. So the reason the stockholders are on top is because they own the company, those who own the company. Now obviously there's different amounts of ownership. You can just have a couple shares of Google because it costs you about 900 each. <laughs> so it may just be a few shares you have. But there's a lot of people that may have a lot more. Then you have the board of directors, and then your officers who report to the board of directors, and then the employees. And that's kind of how it works in this corporate structure there. 
So a corporation has a separate legal existence from its owners. A corporation has transferable units of ownership. You transfer that. And a corporation has limited stockholders' liability. Again, they're not going to be liable if something happens typically as long as it's within the uh, framework there. And then a corporation is subject to taxes. And then we'll talk about double tax taxation and what that means. So there are, there's double taxation as a part of that. taxation that can be a problem with that. We'll talk about some of those things. So these are some of the advantages and disadvantages. This is in your book here, but some of the advantages, obviously, it's a separate legal existence there. We also have uh, it's continuous life. One of, the, one of the great things about the corporations is the opportunity and the ability to raise money uh, amounts of capital. And that's some of the reasons why companies will incorporate and become public, public companies. I was with a company that was private, went public, went back to private, they went public again. <laughs> they went back and forth and back and forth because of you know, the opportunity to be and raise capital. The reason they went public was that they were expecting to grow, and grow lots. And so that's why they decided to, they needed the cash, the influx of cash, if we sell stock to our company, uh, an ownership to our company, that money comes into us to be able to use to expand our company. And here's some of the disadvantages here. Now obviously the double taxation, and we'll talk a little bit about that. What that basically means is this, is that they are taxed, the corporation is taxed, and then the individual is taxed who gets the dividend. So we'll talk about the dividends here too. So that's why it's double taxed. So me as an owner, well the company already got taxed, now I get taxed too because I'm getting some of that money in with my dividends. So that's what they mean there. And then obviously your regulatory costs are substantially higher because there's lots of regulations that you have to follow as part of that. And the owner is separate from the management. All right, some of the first steps is forming a corporation. Let's go through the basics here real quick, and then we'll move forward. There's the application of a corporation with the state. Uh, a lot of people will choose, and we talked a little bit about this already, but uh, because state models differ, they might be able to decide more favorable states. We talked about Delaware before. Uh, being one of them, Nevada is another one that <coughs> people go to, a lot of companies go to. And as you can see here, they just talked about Delaware. And here are just some of the big companies and where they're out of. Some do it where their corporate headquarters are, where they started up, and some just decided to do it in Delaware, as you can see there. And the reason being is they don't have a lot of state regulations and taxes for them. And so that's why a lot of companies will incorporate there even though their headquarters is nowhere near there. As you can see, from California there. It kind of seems like it's cheap. Uh, kind of a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and Nevada is yet another one where you'll see a lot too. So the application is approved. The state grants a charter or an article of incorporation which formally creates the corporation. The next thing is the manager and the board then prepare bylaws, and the rules basically that they're going to follow as part of the company. And so we're going to kind of walk through what this means, the journal entries and all that stuff, because obviously we've got to get to the accounting portion of all of this and what all of this means to us. So a form of incorporation, costs may be incurred, obviously, to do that. These are some of the costs that it costs to do that. So we have organizational expenses to set up our corporation. This may be our first journal entry there. So we have a cash outlay and then our expenses for setting up all of that. Questions on that? First part of the chapter? Pretty simple stuff. You probably had that in other business courses before, so it's probably more of an uh, review on that for you. All right, so let's talk about the two main sources of stockholders' equity. First being, I'll give you a second to uh, take a look at that. And this is a review really from chapter one and two. We talked a little bit about both of these things here. So shareholders equity, shareholders investment or capital. 
you'll see that in this too. So we have paid in capital and retained earnings. We've used both of those, right? Remember, we've had those. So paid in capital is money from the investors. So money that has been brought in so we may have sold some shares for the company. The retained earnings comes from reinvestments of our earnings, what we've made. Basically what we've kept of what we made. And that obviously is our net income minus our dividends and what we continue to keep in the part of that. So that's where the two portions lie. So let's read these, read these two here. Questions? And we've kind of already covered a lot of this. All right, so this is my stockholders' equity example here of that. We have our common stock retained earnings, and that gives me my total stockholders' equity. Now, we're talking here that there's only one class of stock because there could be other classes of stock. Some companies have other classes. So you have a common stock, because it's called common, is that's what's most out there. And so that's what we, we see typically when we look out there, they may go Google selling for 890 or whatever it is at right now. Um, that's typically what we see is cap common stock. We'll talk about some other ones in just a moment here. And that's usually called common stock or capital stock. Now retained earnings is a corporation's cumulative net income that has not been distributed as dividends. So we're adding to it all the time. Every period or every time we so maybe every year, we're adding to that, that we have not given out dividends. And those dividends are distributed corporation uh, to stockholders, basically, for the earnings that they made. Now, companies don't always have to provide dividends. You know, talking about like Apple or Google, they don't really provide it. These companies are smaller or new startups that are recent. A lot of times won't provide dividends because they want to use that money to reinvest and grow their company talked about before. Well, established companies may pay their shareholders out with dividends. All right, so a debit balance and retained earnings is called a deficit. Not good. We don't want that. That means we're losing. So we're accumulating losses. We don't want that. That's a bad thing. That means we're going to have to pull money from somewhere else. We need to put more stock out there or increase the, the value of our stock. And so we really don't want to have that. We really want a credit balance there. So credit balances uh, does not represent a surplus of cash or cash left over for dividends. It says it does not, right? Because we have cash on the other side of the balance sheet. What it's saying, you know, is, is this is the value of the common, the common stock, and then this is the value of the retained earnings. Now, whatever's on the other side meets, matches that. Now, it could be other things that could have a lot in council receive, hopefully not. We talked already about that, right? How that would affect us. We'll talk about that later tonight when we talk about chapter 14. All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about the different classes. Remember, I said there was one class that we just looked at, it was a common stock. We're going to talk about some other things here. So, the number of shares of stock uh, that a corporation is authorized to issue is stated in the charter. So, there may be a certain amount that they're authorized to issue. That's what they talked to the state about. This is maybe it's a million shares, but it doesn't mean that I issue all of them. I may hold some of those in there for us, um, and then eventually we may put some more out. Maybe not. And the reason you do that, yes, we control the price by then. If you remember back from economics, supply and demand. And so if we don't have a lot of our shares out there, there may be a higher demand for those. So we, they'll help increase the price. And we'll talk about that when we come to treasury stocks what that means and what we can do with those type of things there. So we may have authorized a bunch, but may not have it all out there. So the term issued refers to the shares issued to stockholders. Those are the ones that have been put out there. They're out there, and they may be trading back and forth. Those are the ones that are issued. So they can trade those back and forth, whoever, but those are maybe half a million that are out there out of our million. We keep the other half a million that are in. So a corporation maybe requires some of the stock to, that has been issued, they reacquire those, and those are the, and the, uh, the stock remaining in the hands of the stockholders is then called outstanding stock, what's out there, still out there. And we may reacquire those, and we'll get to that in treasury stock in just a second here. So this is kind of how it looks. 
This is what's authorized, the whole big pie. And here's what's issued. So all of this out here, we have. And then there's what might be outstanding. So this might be outstanding for me, brought some of this back in that's been issued out there. And that's called treasury. We'll talk about that in a few moments. So a corporation may issue stock certificates to stockholders who document their ownership. Not really done a lot anymore, obviously. It's pretty much all electronic. We used to, back in the day, you used to get a stock certificate. You own five shares of stock. In fact, my grandparents have, I don't know how much stock they had at home, but they still have my grandpa does. He actually has a stock certificate. <laughs> but uh, we, we just don't see that anymore. I, I, have, I, I have tons of stock, but I haven't seen a stock certificate for it. Since I was very young. Okay, shares of stock are often uh, assigned a dollar amount called par value. Remember that word, par value. Reason being is this is basically when we assign to put our shares out there, we have to assign a value to it. And so some companies sent one dollar or one penny, somebody sent ten dollars, twenty dollars, hundred dollars. They just set a value to it. So that's what we have as our baseline for everything. So when we see common stock, we have that. Additional pain and capital is the difference of all that there. We'll have some other stuff in it out there. But just be aware par value is what we set at the beginning. So some corporation that stopped issuing stock certificates, except for own special requests, you can see there. And there's also companies that do that are issued without par is called no, no par stock. Now some states may require you to have it. Uh, a stated value. So state, state may say, still say that, but they have some sort of stated value because the state requires it under the charter. And uh, some states require that corporations maintain a minimum stockholder contribution called the capital. That is basically to help protect those creditors that are out there, make sure that they're not um, running too far in debt there. So the major rights that accompany ownership of a share of stock are as follows. So if I own just one share, this is what I'm able to do. One, I'm able to vote. Obviously, I don't have the voting power of somebody like Warren Buffett that may own tons of many millions of shares of this corporation, whatever it may be. But I have the right to vote. And I also have a right to the distribution of earnings, which is the dividends. Now, I get a small chunk. <laughs> if I have one share versus somebody that has a million shares. Because they may say, I'm going to give you 40 cents per share. Well, that's 40 cents for my per share and a half. Whereas somebody that has a million shares, that's a lot more. That's $400,000. That's a lot more money. But you might point it, basically, I'm able to share in that. You have the right to share in assets upon liquidation. So if they liquidate, pretty far down the list. So I'm probably not going to get a lot out of my one share. So maybe, maybe the stock was worth $100. By the time I liquidate, I may only get a few dollars uh, value to that, if I'm lucky. So, but that you are able to get that, because it's part of being an owner, you are uh, able to get the assets of liquidation. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but sometimes it does. All right, so classes of stock. We've already talked a little bit about some of them. I kind of briefly talked about a couple of those there. So there's two primary classes of paid in capital, or common stock and preferred stock. All right. So as we're talking about some of these in, in, this, in the class here, just know the differences between common stock and preferred stock. The preferred stock won't move as much, and won't fluctuate in price very much. But one of the things you have to do realize is the reason you get preferred stock, it's kind of hybrid between a bond or a stock in the fact that usually, typically, you'll get a pretty good dividend with this here. So you're getting a dividend as part of that. And, and since you're getting that dividend, Sometimes it's called a cumulative, but basically they, have, they owe it to you every year. It's like a debt that they owe. We'll talk about that when we come, uh, come up in a few slides here. So the, some of the attractiveness is the dividends over the common stock. So they'll always pay the, pro, uh, the, uh, pay the preferred stock before they pay the common stock on those dividends. And we'll talk along through some problems in just a few moments here. Let's see who's at the front of the line. <coughs> The payment of dividends is authorized by the corporation's board of directors. So there's three dates you're going to have to look at as a part of this. 
So the corporation decides to, okay, the board of directors says, we are going to authorize payment of this. So, and then the directors have to say they declared a dividend when they want to authorize that there. So we'll take a look at the three days. I'll show you that in just a few moments, how that breaks down. Then also, the cumulative preferred stock has a right to receive the regular dividends that were not declared in prior years. So if for some reason we lost money and we weren't able to pay a dividend, since I'm a preferred stockholder, they still need to pay me what they were supposed to pay me back there. So that's some of, so if I was supposed to get a 4% dividend, they need to pay that, so it's cumulative. So that means they have to pay me the next year, they owe me for the past year and that year. And if they don't pay me that year, then they owe me for the three years there. And so those are the things, as a part of being a preferred stockholder, we'll talk, take a look at a problem here in just a moment that kind of puts some of that together. Now, non-cumulative preferred stock does not have this right. So cumulative, cumulative being everything. Non-cumulative means I only get paid when they're able to pay me. Okay, you get, I guess I understand the difference there. So cumulative, I, I get paid. Regard, they need to pay me even for back ones that they have not paid me. Or cumulative, non-cumulative, excuse me, they don't have to pay me every year. Now, cumulative preferred stock dividends that have not been paid in prior years are said to be in arrears, so they owe us that money. All right. So a corporation has issued the following preferred income stock. So we're going to look at some examples here that we'll work out a problem on our own here. So they have a thousand shares of four dollar cumulative preferred stock at fifty dollars par, and then they have four thousand shares of common stock at fifteen dollars par. Okay. So the corporation is organized. On this date, paid no dividends in 12 and 13. And in 12, 2014, they paid $22,000 of dividends. Remember this word right here, cumulative. So that means it's owed. So they owe us for the back years. So they decided to pay this here, of which 12,000 was paid to the preferred stockholders and 10 was paid to the common stockholders. Okay, so let's break it down here. So total dividends here. So 2012, they owe me four. They owe four thousand because we have a thousand shares of those times four dollars. So four thousand. So they have to pay back for 2012. That's what they're saying here. Then 2013, well, they still have to pay that too, right here. 2014, they still have to pay that too. And now the rest of it, they can go to common stock after they've made all their payments and caught everything up. Now they can pay the common stock. And so the common stock gets what's left over. We have 4,000, 4,000, 4,000, that's $12,000. We have 22, so therefore we have $10,000 left over. And so that will go into common stock. Uh, here. So that's what's paid off. And there's the 10,000 that's remaining for the common stock course. Now we had how many stock holders in that one? You remember seeing that? Was that hundred thousand shares? We have a hundred thousand common says. We have a slide to say. We have four thousand common. So then we break that down to divide up by oh, four thousand. That would be how much each of the shareholders would get. So that's how that would break down. So when it says like fifteen dollars per, that's how much they pay for their share. No, that's, that's how much we have the stated value for it. That's our stated value. for that doesn't mean that what they paid for it. They could have paid 100, they could have paid 10, 5. It's just what we have a stated value of that part. We'll kind of look and, and dive into that a little more in a little bit here. All right, so a corporation is authorized to issue 10,000 shares of preferred stock at, at $100 par, okay? And 100,000 of common stock at $20 par. So one half of each of the class are authorized is issued at par for cash. So basically half of those. So I take, now they said at par, so 10,000 times this, because we might prefer right here, remember where I'm taking half of that. And then here, common stock, 40 times 100,000 there. And I'm taking that. So we have 500,000 and 1 million here, and that gives us the total for cash. That's what we're bringing in. So by selling all that stock, oh look, I got 1.5 million in now. I've increased my cash flow. We'll talk about chapter 14, going cash flows, what that means to us. 
So questions? That's just a transaction there. So issued stock, if the stock is issued for a price that is more than its par, the stock has been sold at a premium. So that's what it, the difference is there. So if that uh, $15 stock is now 30, we sold it at a premium. If the stock is sold below that, it's at a discount. And we know these terms, premium discounts. We're gonna see that again in chapter 12 when we talk about bonds. You'll see premium and discounts because sometimes you'll purchase a bond for more than it's worth, uh, more because of, it depends on the interest rate, what's going right now versus what it's stayed be. All right, so Caldwell Company issued 2,000 shares of $50 par preferred stock for cash at $55. So what happens here is this. Okay, they issued this, so that's my part, so that's my preferred stock right here, but I got more cash in than that. So you can see the $10,000 difference there, and that is my paid it in capital in excess of par. Basically what that is, it just outlines it for you there. So that's additional money will go into this account here, and paid in capital in excess of par. And then I have that additional cash. Total cash on market. So the preferred stock and the additional there. So appropriations require land for which the fair market value cannot be determined in exchange for land, the corporation issued this amount of shares, $10 common, that had a market value of 12. So again, it's worth $2 more than my part. So that's why I have 20,000 more in my uh, additional paid capital. Because of that extra $2 times the 10,000 shares. Questions on that one? All right, let's take a look at a problem here. Uh, if you turn to page 522, I want you to take a look at PE 11 <coughs> 18. I'm going to give you guys a moment to take a look at the example I have here of that, which is on page uh, 502. Okay, we'll put a pump up here. And this will be similar to one of your problems you'll have in the homework. Problem set it up similar to what you see on page 502.
All right. Let's kind of review this question. Are you guys get close? I'll give you guys a few more moments then to finish it up. Now remember as you're looking at this, they put the amount distributed first. And remember who gets paid first, preferred dividends. So if this is a cumulative problem, if I remember correctly. So and since it's cumulative, we must pay the preferred first. So if we don't pay all of it in year one, we then have to roll that over into year two to make sure they get paid that full amount. Because they should get the amount that we have stated. Let's go over this here. So I put the amount distributed, which they gave us, 30,000 year one, 90 year two, 125 year three. Now looking at this problem, how much was supposed to be given to the, uh, the preferred stock? 2%? So how much are they supposed to get each, each, uh, each year? 2%? Yeah, the same, yeah, okay, so, sorry. <laughs> That's I guess it didn't really go over it real well here. <laughs> so take the, uh, the $60 report value. Uh -huh. That's what you're going to get it off oh, of there. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Is that? It tells us that the uh, part value is 60. Sure. So about 48,000. Yeah, 48,000. So that is what we're putting away over here. That is what they should get every year. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot to you know, do a real good job with the PowerPoints that have it in there, so when I went over it, didn't have that. So, will they pay out a partial, or are they just going to hold No, they'll pay off the partial, whatever they have. So, take a look at that here. They will pay all 30000 to preferred, right? Now, because of that, if they're supposed to pay, that means nothing's left for dividends, right? Or right. comes so we have zero. Or I'll just put it zero here, make it similar to C. All right. So that means in year two, they pay out 90. Well, remember here that they owed 48. How much do they have left over then? They owe 18. 18. So basically, I'm going to take 18 here plus the 48. $66,000. It should go in there. That makes sense? And so now they got their full amount there of it. So when you say 2% of whatever it is, it's off of the par value there. Just remember that as you're thinking of that. That's what I have here. Now since they paid 66,000 there, well I have some left over, right? So that left over then goes to these guys. And so now I have those, and so it goes to 24,000 right here. Questions so far? Okay, so now the last, but we don't have any arrears, right? We don't have anything that's owed to us. So they get the full 48 right here into our preferred, and the rest of that will go to common stock. So that would be 77? Yeah. 77,000? All right. So now I have the breakdown of what they got paid. Now I've got to figure out the bottom down here, this stuff here. And what that basically means is this. How much does each shareholder get of that? Okay, so now in here, well, obviously the common is zero, because zero 
<laughs> Nobody gets anything there, so we know it's zero here. That's uh, now the preferred is basically this. I'm going to take the thirty thousand dollars divided by how many shares I have out there. Right here, which is forty thousand. So we have forty thousand here. Seventy-five cents. Perfect. That's what they're going to get. Is seventy-five cents. Because I'm paying thirty thousand out, but I have only forty thousand. I have forty thousand shares, so they each get seventy-five cents of that. And depending on how many shares you have, that's how much you get. All right. So in this one, similar thing. We want to take the sixty-six and then divide it by forty. And then this one here, you'll take me 4,000 divided by the 50, which 48 cents. All right. And then you'll do the same thing for the last one here now. This one should be $1.20. Yeah, $1.54. $1.54? Yeah. Now, they're supposed to get $1.20 every year. That's what they're supposed to get. So, number 2% of the 60, that's what they're supposed to get is $1.20. Every year. That's at least, right? Was that? Uh, uh, yeah, at least. That's, well, that, that's what they should get, regardless. The the they they'll, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're should, uh, yeah, they should always get that. Now, they should, will dip, you know, depending on if they go into rears or not. Now, the common stock will change, as you can see, 0, 24 to 77,000. It will change quite a bit. But the preferred, they're supposed to get this. They didn't get that there, but they got more of it there to make up for that previous. So questions on that one? Do it okay? All right. So that's one of the homework problems that you will see. All right, so let's take a look at, uh, as we move forward here, Take a look at the no par stock. So without a par, on uh, January 9th, a corporation issues 10,000 shares of no par common stock at $40 a share. So $40 a share. On June 27th, the corporation issues an additional 1,000 shares at $36 a share. So in here, since we have no par, we just put all the common stock. Because there's no additional paying capital above par, because we have no par. So everything goes into common stock, which makes it a lot easier. So in here we just have the forty dollars share times the ten thousand. So we get four hundred thousand common stock, and then we have four hundred thousand in cash that comes in to us. And then similarly with this one here, we get thirty six thousand coming in. So we have cash here and the common stock. Questions? So no part just means everything's common. Yeah, everything will go into common. So you don't have a you know. Uh, part of, yeah, you don't have that in additional paying capital. You just have the common stock. So it makes it a little easier that way. You'll see some <coughs> ways though uh, out there. So some states require that the entire proceeds for the issue of no par stock be recorded as legal capital. Other states no par may be assigned a state value because they may require that to have at least some sort of value to it. So in here, there's that state value which is basically the same thing as above par, uh, par value. But they call it stated value because that's what they required to do. And so that's just the difference here when we looked at the previous one a couple slides ago. So we have cash, 400,000, and the common stock and the additional paying capital above that. And that's just sitting at 25 from the previous slide. All right. So now we're going to take a look at the, uh, the accounting for cash dividends and stock dividends. As we look at this, I want you to kind of picture when you, when you hear those words, remember that cash dividends is basically cash. Okay? And that's what this is basically telling us here. So they're going to be paid out in cash. And there's three conditions the corporation must meet to pay a cash dividend. And they are, one, they need to have enough and retain earnings. They don't have to have made money. They have to have enough retained earnings to pay that, though. Because remember, it's cumulative that retained earnings. So they must have enough in there. 
Now, typically, you want to make more than a year that you pay off the dividends. But sometimes you have that requirement, you'll pay it regardless. So, you must have sufficient cash. Obviously, we can't pay out cash if you don't count the cash. And then, formal action by the board of directors saying that this is what we're going to do. It must be done. Now, so I remember I said early on tonight that we talked about the different dates you're going to have there. Well, so there's three different dates we're going to talk about that. The first date is the date of declaration. That means when the board of directors says, we are going to pay this, we now have a liability that goes in our books. We now owe this because we have an obligation because we made now a commitment to pay. So that's why we incur the liability to pay the amount of the dividend, so whatever it may be. Then we have the date of record. This is different and really requires no reporting for us. The date of record is basically this. On uh, October 10th, so a few days here, that day everybody that owns a share of stock will get a dividend. That's what the date of record means. It doesn't mean anything to the corporation. All they're going to do is pay out who those people are. But that is the, so if you sell right before it, well, you'll get that dividend. But if you buy it that day, you get that dividend, even though you didn't own it prior to that. So that's what the date of record is. And the date of payment, well, makes sense, it's just the date it's going to be paid out. So, and that's when it'll come out, we'll set the cash, and then we'll, we'll do the journal entries for that and show what that means here. So basically, that's what the date of payment is. So in here, we're going to now walk through a transaction with all the dates and everything there. So on October 1st, uh, Hebrew Corporation declares the cash dividends shown below with a date of record on uh, November 10th and date of payment of December 2nd. So here we have now a liability. And here is when we're paying on that liability. And here, the only thing that matters here is who we're paying to. So we don't really, we have no transactions going to happen. So the first transaction is now we have that liability. So what we do is we debit cash dividends. Now that's a debit in the owner's equity. That means we are taken away from our retained earnings. So that's debit, so that's taken away from that. And to take away from that, we are now add, adding additional commitment to pay, which is another liability. So that's what cash dividends pay will is. On the data record, there's no entry, like I said before. Uh, basically, just who do we pay it to? And finally, on December 2nd, the next thing is now we're going to pay that. So cash goes out, and then we eliminate our cash dividends payable that we paid our obligation to that. And so those are the general entries that go with that. So questions on how that broke down with different dates, what that all means? All right. Let's look here at uh, page 507. You'll see an example that I'm going to have you just look at that for a moment, and then we're going to do a problem on page 522. You'll see basically that example I just gave you in the previous slides. That example I showed you there on 507 will help with this problem. It should be pretty quick, it should just take you a couple moments to do that. Remember what each dates mean.
All right, so the first one here, we have the commitment to pay. So we have cash dividends payable. We go cash dividends first off, we're taking that out there. So we have 1.25 million. And then we have cash dividends payable. We have that commitment to pay them. So we have that going in our dividends account, which is taken away from our retained earnings. And then we have the liability to pay. We have no rent entry required on October 15th because it doesn't matter to us who we're paying it to, other than we, where we send the checks, but we're still going to pay this off. And then lastly, we have the cash dividends payable for the 1.25 million, and then we're using cash to pay that. So questions on how that worked? All right, Any questions there? Well, so that's the cash given. It's pretty simple. This is what we're going to pay out. Those are the trends that those are the dates that we have to worry about. Now let's talk about stock dividends. It gets a little more complicated than this that what we're going to do now, instead of giving them cash, we're going to give them stock. So when you hear me say cash, when you see something that says cash dividend, well, that means they're getting cash. When you see stock, that means they're getting stock dividends. Basically what it says there. So basically we're declaring that as a portion, if you owe 10 share or one share, we're going to give you a portion of another share or whatever it may be. And so that's what it means by giving them some additional stock. And so that is an additional thing that they get in as being an owner. So let's take a look here. So on December 15th, the board of directors of Hendrix Corporation declared a 5% stock dividend of 100,000 shares. So for, of 100,000 shares to be issued out there. So because of that, to be issued on, these are the dates, January 10th, December 31st of the date of record, and this is the date that they declared it. Okay, and the market price of the declaration is $31 a share. So now we gotta figure out, well, what's it cost to us to put that out there and give that to them? So we have 100,000 shares, what's that? That is two million shares that are out there that uh, people have. And so we are, 5% of that two million is 100,000 shares that they're, we're gonna be distributing out there as a part of it. So in here, to us, this is what it means to us here. We have a stock dividend of 3.1 billion, because that's what's gonna cost us to put that out there. Why? When we have 100,000 shares we're gonna issue at $31 a share. So 31 times 10, 100,000 gives us 3.1 billion. And this is the stock dividend distributable is the two million because the part value is at twenty, and then any additional payment capital is at Okay, so that's where the difference comes in on this one. So at the end of the period, the stock dividend distributable and the payment capital in excess of par common stock accounts are reported as the payment capital section of the balance sheet. This is affects the proceeds of the dividend transfer three point one million of retained earnings to now pay in capital. We'll talk about that, we will take a look at this right now here. So, we have this common stock here, so the stock dividend is distributed to stockholders that we by issuing that 100,000 shares of stock. This is the following issue, so we have that, that's the part value of it. So that kind of gives you an example there, so let's take a look at another one here. This is where we're going to look. The transition is not the best on this one, so we're transitioning to another problem that's different. So in here, before and after stock dividends distribution here. So this is it kind of it's the same stock, but before the stock dividend they had ten thousand. Now we have ten thousand and sixty. If they had six percent stock dividend, so that's now how many shares I have. I go from I get an additional six hundred shares. We get that by multiplying by six percent. So in here, if I number of shares owned by one stockholder, if I had a thousand, now I have a thousand six. One thing that you want to see here is my ownership proportion hasn't changed. Okay. So yes, we're opening out more of that, but I still own the same percentage of the company. I just get my share and my additional shares there, and so it's nice for me because the shares. Those $31 a share or whatever it may be, 
I get a few extra accounts on that, so that's nice for me as a part of the owner. So it's still 10% of the same. All right, so questions on stocks? You ready to do one then? Yes, no? Yeah. Sure, sure. All right. Sounds fun. All right, an example for that one is on page 508. So if you want to look at 508, I'll give you a good example there. And we're going to do 11, 4, uh, 4, 8. So I'll give you guys a couple moments to work through that one, and then I will uh, go through the young board here. Again, remember there on like data render, we have no entry. And what are we taking the two percent of? So that for that for this one here, because it's going to cost us a certain amount to buy those shares. So that's what we want to figure out what it is, and then we'll break it down from the excess part and then the uh, common stock. So there's no entry required for anything except for the May second, right? May second and February fifteenth, because we have a commitment to pay at that point on the first one. Oh, there is something you do. Yeah, the first one you do. It's a uh, final way. Has a good example of it. The bottom of the page.
5,000? Yeah. Basically 2% of the, uh, the shares that we have. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. First, take 2% of the, first needs to, uh, of the value. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so that's what this okay. is here. Okay. This is how many shares we're going to distribute out there. It's 5,000. It's 2% of the 250,000. Is the 5,000 there. Actually, I should have probably put it in the way around. That was my fault. I'll let me change that for you. Put another location here. That way you can see them better. It still works out the same thing. <laughs> but it's easier to see. I visually have it. see it here that way. Yeah, they're getting, they're going to distribute out 5,000 shares out there. And so our par value of that is the, fourth, uh, the $40. So we take 5,000 times 40 is 200,000. And then the extra $12 a share is how you figure out the payment capital, 12,000 uh, times, or excuse me, $12 a share times the 5,000 gives you the 60. Questions on that one?